Good afternoon from Chicago and uh, welcome to the third in our summer series of webinars to feature speakers from our client conference, which as many of you know, has been postponed until June of next year. We hope that all of you are healthy and hanging in there. Our topic today is timely, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on insurers and what to do next. Our featured speakers are Robert Rudy of Oliver Wyman and Don Bukovic of MVP Advisory. Both of their firms, Oliver Wyman and MVP Advisory, provide comprehensive consulting services to the insurance industry. Good, af good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, John, for that introduction. Uh, Don and I uh, have uh, some material prepared for you today. Uh, some of the pages are a little bit dense, uh, so to, uh, to keep in mind that uh, you'll be able to have uh, copies of this presentation uh, at the, uh, sent to you uh, for later reference. Uh, just to go over the agenda uh, very briefly. Um, so as you know, COVID, COVID has had a pretty significant impact, not only on our, our industry, but on consumers and our agent partners. Um, so in the, in the recent past, insurers have mobilized to get back to you know, basic operations. Um, but the new, the new agenda is to get ready for you know, how COVID and, uh, and other impact you know, will, will, will play out over the next 18 to 24 months and uh, you know, drive make potential changes in your strategy and your business model. So you know, as we've seen, insurers are now responding to new risks. They are uh, scrambling to adapt to new consumer behavior and new channel preferences, especially for digital uh, engagement, and uh, thinking hard about what's really core to their business and how will they operate uh, differently going forward. <clears throat> we also have a couple of uh, case examples we'll show you, uh, which illustrate how uh, uh, clients of ours are uh, adapting to this change and are moving aggressively in this time of uncertainty. <clears throat> you know, uh, this, this uh, illustration shows how COVID will have significant impact uh, on the economy and, and our, our industry for many years ahead. You know, you could argue we're somewhere in the middle of uh, probably the beginnings of, of phase B here where there are some gradual uh, reopenings, uh, certainly stay at home and, and, and remote working is, is still the norm uh, with limited uh, you know, uh, opportunities to engage in large groups and with a number of waves probably occurring. The big question is when does phase three start, or sorry, phase C start, right? Containment and how will, how will we operate differently? Uh, and if you look at some of the uh, key challenges uh, and issues, uh, you know, not only for our industry, but others, it seems that we're all focused on operational resiliency and flexibility, right? Um, you know, economic activity is slowing, uh, unclear as to the pace of recovery. This is what has major impact on our customers, be they commercial or, or consumer customers. Uh, new risks are emerging, certainly cyber uh, fraud, uh, third party data uh, access. And you know, it, it certainly as you have a remote workforce, that's exposing uh, your company to these risks as well. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, with, with this uncertainty on where, where consumers will be, uh, how they'll be behaving and how our agents and brokers will be interacting with us, we, we probably need to take a hard look at operating models, how they will change going forward, and our strategy. So again, operational resilience. Um, how flexible is your organization, right? How quickly can you put in new pricing, new policy terms, uh, change your underwriting rules, uh, and actually plan, plan for multiple scenarios going forward? Um, you know, Oliver Wyman did a survey last month. Uh, I don't want to uh, drain this slide, but uh, I think it was telling uh, when we look at uh, what senior executives are saying. You know, guess what? You know, we were actually able to move a lot more quickly than we thought, right? So maybe we should adapt this uh, speed as as the speed that we need to operate going forward. Um, you know, there are some things we were doing in the past that uh, we're not so we're not so productive. 
you know, our sales reps in some cases are even more effective now that they're not traveling on and on the road. Uh, so there are some, there are some, I guess this has been a shock to the system that is uh that has caused um companies to, to take a look at you know what's really fundamental to our business and you know also i think probably put more new emphasis on you know that old skill of uh, scenario modeling right because we don't know exactly how this is going to play out so we need to have you know di different plans in place for different scenarios you know i think uh as well this is just an illustration of look companies looking at you know what's the survival minimum what's really necessary for us to in, to ensure uh, basic functions, right? And then you know, beyond that, there are some things we need to have in place so that we can adapt and be and be flexible uh, to implement again again some different scenarios coming up. Uh, and then certainly discretionary. I think uh, uh, we've all seen that uh, there are things we're doing in the past that aren't necessarily value added. So you know, I think the leading companies that that we're working with are thinking about you know. Let's not go back to the past. Uh, let's let's uh, take this opportunity to uh, rethink, rethink, and come back stronger. Um, real briefly, in terms of the return to office, uh, we've been working with clients, you know, on a pretty comprehensive view of how to engage their workforce, to uh, energize them, and keep them motivated in this period of remote. Then, as they come back to the office, uh, phasing that and figuring out. You know who's in, on which team and uh, which days they're there. You know how is how is the physical workplace being reconfigured, um, and how are we accommodating the needs of uh, specific uh, you know cust uh, seg uh, sorry specific um, employee groups. You know those who may have elder parents. You know elderly they're taking care of or kids, and the, the whole school situation is a big question mark. You know some of some of your uh, regions may be going back to school full time, other regions may not be. Um, and then finally, and you'll see in the case examples, you know, how does our workflow uh, need to change, right? So there were some fundamental changes to working remotely. Um, and, you know, we, we've been doing that in sort of piecemeal fashion, but if this is the new normal, you know, how do we, how do we document that and build it into the way we, way we work going forward? So I think those who are, uh simply returning you know planning on a return to work under the uh under the old model are missing potentially missing an opportunity to really rethink uh the way they operate and uh potentially serve customers and and the channel more effectively going forward and just an illustration on uh for example the distribution impact um working with a carrier right now who had uh, a plan to automate life underwriting and, and add more straight through processing. That plan was kind of on the shelf. It was going to be put in in 2021. Well, guess what? They pull that, but they pull that uh, off the shelf and are uh, undergoing, uh, putting a lot of resource into accelerating their uh, non-medical underwriting processes for, uh, for in this case, a term, you know, a term book of business. Uh, but you know, again, agents are looking to uh, interact differently with customers you know, with, a, with a lot less face-to-face -face impact, uh, uh, contact, I'm sorry. Um, and then the whole physical presence of uh, delivering you know, paper for signature and all that. I mean, if you were working on that, you probably are finding that's a higher priority than it was you know, in February, let's say. John, do we have any questions that have come in uh, over the? Uh... Uh, yes, we do. And I apologize uh, for my earlier sound quality, and I hope this is better. Um, question came in, Robert, what evidence have you seen where insurers are actually making permanent changes to their business operations or strategy? Oh, sure. Um, let's see. Well, I can think of a couple. I mean, I think you probably saw early on, it might have been even April, nationwide uh i think permanently closed two of their four uh largest locations uh columbus is still open uh but two of their locations were, 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 which had thousands of employees uh have been permanently closed so those there's no option for those employees to work other than remotely um you know i think uh don will speak later on to uh certainly 
much more uh, emphasis on accelerated uh, movement to the cloud. If that was sort of on your on your radar as a plan, it's probably now something you're implementing. Uh, there's another uh, top five uh, US uh, PNC carrier I've been working with that's uh, evaluating which of their regional offices to close permanently. Um, and certainly, as I mentioned before, this acceleration of uh, you know, sort of contactless uh, life underwriting uh, as a as a trend. Uh, we've seen uh, new insure techs come in uh, that you know they're they're accelerating that process. The reinsurers uh, are actually developing uh, products and underwriting standards for uh, you know not taking fluid you know for 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 life insurance. So uh, there are you know a number of examples where what were sort of back burner or sort of two to three years from now projects that are now actually happening uh, in real time. Any others? No, that's good, thank you. Okay, all right, right, we're on track then. So the, the remainder, we have maybe 15, 20 minutes uh, of, of case studies. Uh, the first one uh, Don will speak to, uh, and that is basically taking a company that you know, it is thought through how their business model will change in the post-COVID world and uh, aligning uh, aligning all these uh, sort of various uh, change levers to, uh, to, to go on an accelerated plan to uh, implement um, a, a new business model. The second one is similar, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a deep dive into, uh, I guess, the complexity, I guess, the planning needs and the complexity of working to accelerate a digital transformation program. And then there's another, another one where I've worked with a client who actually, with a stalled digital transformation effort, decided to basically start completely over um, and, and with a greenfield company uh, uh, and based it in the cloud 100%. And they were able to roll out uh, new products from scratch in, uh, in about a 10 month period. So three uh, case examples for you. Hopefully, we'll provide, uh, I guess, some practical, practical uh, views on, on how companies are are dealing with uh, the response to COVID. So I'll hand it over to Don. Great, thank you, Robert. I appreciate that, and appreciate everyone who has joined us on this webinar. The first case study, just a, a quick background, really focuses on what Robert talked about—that holistic viewpoint and multi-dimensional planning process. And the client that uh, uh, this is about is really in the PNC area, but we're also uh, doing the same type of effort over in the life and annuity side. So it is the process can be handled across uh, both organizations or both types of industries. The key here really is around a very focused approach to take a look at all the different levers within the organization at a high level and really do some horse trading around the impacts and a very uh, quick, agile way to get through uh, the update of tactical and strategic initiatives that need to happen as response to COVID, and really looking at the key impacts that have happened in regards to uh, COVID and pandemic world onto their operations, and then finalize formalizing it into what our expectations are from a financial projections that have been developed by the client, not only for the near term, but also the longer term. So when we look at this holistic multidimensional, what we're talking about are really 11 key levers that we focused on to create impact statements overlaying COVID and its impact on each of these components. We asked the senior management team to create an impact statement with their team as to how this will impact them today, uh, midterm and longer term into what they need to do. And more importantly, how does it modify or change the vision? of what they're having. And then together bringing it back and understanding if agency has three primary items that they need to take care of to stay uh, ahead of the game in digital and digitization. Uh, also understanding then the impact it would have on the other 10 levers and their plans. So that multi-dimensional approach is critical. And an example very simply is one of the aspects that they came up with is cybersecurity was a product that was growing and needed to uh, be impacted uh, through COVID. Not only in the current product set, but due to the remote customers, taking a look at that product and then pushing that out farther. That impacted both the pricing models they had, the product mix models, 
and their distribution to digital. Of course, it also had impacts on how they're going to manage the claims and the exposure that are coming up. And working through the organization specifically with just that example that was driven by product, we could understand the implications across all the different organizations that it would have on the profit and on the operations. When we looked through that and we walked through each one's impact vision statements, we compared them to the initiatives that they have going on as well as new initiatives that we came up with and looked through a prioritization process as far as impact into the organization, both impact on the customer, the organization, and the profitability. And we quickly got, the team quickly got to a point where there were 15 immediate ones that had to happen quickly. And that was everything from remote workers and making sure the secure environment is happening to uh, HR related cultural aspects to support the remote worker to the customer. Those were low hanging fruit that needed to happen immediately. So we took those and started off directly on those quickly. We also then were able to take the other items and start to prioritize them into high, which is high impact, uh, high need, all the way to low. And the critical nature of this, people wanted uh, as a team to stop after we got the high ones done, but the fact of the matter was by going through all of them, we were able to focus the organization on the most critical and really reduce the conversation or churn on the items that we're focusing on the low and medium items that will not be worked on during this time frame. They can become up later on, but that's really all it has to do. So once we had those laid out, then we took at quantifying the impact on profitability. And the interesting part is how we quantified it. Now this organization itself had some issues in profitability before going into this, and they felt that it could be even more of an impact if they were not able to address the profitability. So what we looked at is each of the initiatives and their correlations between them, what could they have, what could the impact on profitability be? So when you look at this example, you know, underwriting had a significant impact on profitability. And, and the way we looked at it was that what would be the impact if we did nothing and our expectation on profitability to do it to if we did all the initiatives that were uh, impacted on underwriting. And that fan is the 11%. When you look at all of them, then it's not only individually what happens, but then how do they relate? So as we talked about on the cyber example, underwriting would have to be done differently for the cyber product set. Product is impacted. Pricing had to be updated and brought into the organization. The digital aspect of the delivery. And most importantly, how's that going to impact the product mix and uh, the need and resourcing of capital to that product? That's just one simple example. We walked through several of their products that were liability-based. We worked through the auto, and people are very familiar, if you've seen on the auto side, the reduction in rates or the refunds and the credits and how that's working due to a lower exposure happening and those impacts. So this is just an example of how we take a look at the whole organization, how the group together worked at that multidimensional, holistic approach and came up with a plan that focused the organization so that they could start moving forward and really help them out slowly going into this budgeting and planning process into next year. On case study two, case study two really is a company that was looking to do, get into business transformation. This started before COVID and they were going through the process and the planning and they realized very quickly that with the change to remote employees, the complexity of the organization, the complexity of the solution set, they really had to get more granular in their planning process and their delivery execution. And the simple example as we go remotely, more and more uh, work has to be well documented so that there isn't gaps in clarity. The first thing we did is look back and very quickly get to the three drivers that people could walk around and continually use in understanding when they're making decisions. Number one was making sure that they untackle the top line growth. They have to get rid of their products, put a new set of product uh, in that can be flexible and agile to the system that can be easily designed and easily implemented. And that was critical to the organization. The expense reduction in the manual, going through all the manual steps and underwriting and claims, that were making it difficult to service a client in the digital environment became critical to the organization to reduce. And finally, what was came up 
which was not on the original uh, plan that they have, was really looking at the strains of controls and compliance that the pandemic is putting on the organization, as well as the re regulatory frameworks that are coming out and how they're impacting the organization, how to put that into the project and into the transformations so that it comes out more automated and uh, effective. From there then, once we understood what that was, the levers that really were critical on the project and the replanning were easily identified. It was moving to a customer-centric model versus the channel-centric model. Once again, looking at that harmonized product structure so that they can quickly and efficiently implement products, modify products, and adjust to the environment that's happening around them, not only from customer expectation, but external to the customers and their impacts. They needed to move quickly, much more quickly than they were to the digital user experience. They had it on the roadmap, don't get me wrong, they had it there, but it was, as Robert said, years out. How did they pull it in? How do you plan for it? How do you get it out there? Who is needed? Uh, and then moving from an automated process versus some of the manual steps that are also necessary people-wise. A little bit of some of the use of technology becoming in play, not significant, but enough to move it so that you can uh, create that digital experience and not increase uh, pricing. So, and finally, the flexibility. Everything had to be done very quickly and had to be able to be implemented quickly and modified. So those four aspects really had actions directly related to the plans that we were putting in place and the benefits. And with that, then, we were able to take that and go through that discovery process and drive out the key questions and the decision matrices and get those down in detail so people can understand as they're working remotely, both internally and across the organization, externally to vendors, what is driving it, how to make decisions quickly. The sequencing became very critical so that the planning for people's workloads and environments and critical paths were understood so that you know, as the flexible nature in which we are coming in, especially mid-sized companies, people work multiple different roles. They cannot in multiple different tasks. Many times they can't be pulled completely to be on this type of effort forever. So we have to make sure that it's sequenced to work in operations as well as implementation. Understanding the requirements, making sure those are well-defined up front before people start executing in an agile type of uh, format, building them up, even if it's, you know, running through, getting those pieces in place so you can continually update it. So these are the aspects. And then finally, the resourcing. What is really going to happen to the people? This is more than just numbers. So going through that, we went through very detailed, uh, through an, a process that is, you know, very agile in nature, coming up with the catalogs, coming up with the requirements, implementing those, moving to next is the plan, the integration impacts of the surround efforts. You know, what systems are being hit? What data is being hit? Internal, external. What is new technology happening moving to the cloud? Getting some of those key items up front and planned for before you move into the full the execution and diagnostic to move into the delivery. And then finally, people. When are they needed? Who's going to be needed? How long are they going to be needed? One of the biggest impacts from an HR standpoint at the moment is in re remote workers, what is that time of day? We were very clear when they were coming into the office and it was a set time frame. But as people know, it gets expanded when they're at home. So are we going to burn out workers? Will we have enough? And if we keep layering on more and more, what is the impact? So planning down to the very specific levels to the people, when are they needed, who's going to be needed, and for how long ahead of time. And staying ahead of that curve is critical to making sure the new models that we're trying to implement uh, from a staffing standpoint can work properly. So taking a look at that overall digital transformation, replanning, getting it uh, well understood so that you can work through the process agile upfront from a plan standpoint so people can make decisions quickly, can keep in touch with each other and stay on the same page. I think that's it, Robert. Okay. John, I have any, uh, any questions coming in we could uh, respond to? Yes, there are two. Um, one, uh, uh, the case study that you uh, reviewed seems to be an aggressive approach to digital investment. Why shouldn't an insurer just wait it out until the dust settles on this crisis and then after that take a more focused approach? That's the first question. Uh, let me answer the first question. The, the organization took an uh, aggressive approach due to both their customers changing uh, a need 
they're working from home, they're at home, uh, they're uh, not going to see their agents, the distribution channel has been changing, and they needed to make sure that they stayed uh, in tune with that, as well as they were introducing new products that were aligned to the digital channel uh, that are growing very quickly in the marketplace. Cyber, as I mentioned, is, is one example of them. But workers' comp has also been changing as well, and providing that information uh, becomes critical to the new models where people are within other organizations are working remotely uh, via Zoom, via their own uh, webinar type series and internally. So that's why the digital part became very critical to the organization to get ahead of that. Where it was one or two, it was in the top three, but it really wasn't top of line uh, mind in planning it out going forward. Okay, thanks. And the second question was on page 16. Uh, do the numbers shown here reflect how someone rated it or how are these numbers determined? Yeah, good question. This, this was actually rated by the group, uh, the senior management team across all those 11 levers. So it was clear, it was not individually done, but this was a horse trading exercise, if you will, and a significant conversation of which the side benefit is people understood not only what uh, the one specific a lever like agency going to digital was trying to do in the high area, but also fully understood the impact of what it would do to them from an underwriting standpoint, if I was in the underwriting or product side and what the impact is. So it was some horse trading and truly understanding the implications of not doing, doing, and how it impacts the organization. So that's how we came up with uh, that as an organization, then was fully supported by the full management team. Thank you. Great. Yeah, and I guess I would just add, you know, in terms of the go slow, wait till the dust settles approach, um, I, your competitors are, you know, many of your competitors are are moving ahead rapidly, and your customers, you know, are not are, re are probably not going to wait wait around. So to to me, you know, this is Robert. I guess when I think about it, you know, I think you really need to get ahead of this um, as opposed to wait to see how the dust settles. You know, it, I, we mentioned scenario planning before. And uh, you know, in Don's case studies, I mean, obviously there's a high, medium, low and trying to understand, okay, well, if we do this to pricing, what does it do to pro product and vice versa? You know, I, I think that uh, get, getting out there and, and planning for the future is sort of more important than it ever, than it ever, ever has been. Okay, um, great questions. Um, okay, so we have a few more minutes and uh, before we wrap up, there's one more case study we can take you through. Uh, this is a client that uh, is actually not in the U.S., uh, but it's a, about a $600 million uh, multi-line company in the Dominican Republic, of all places, that uh, I spent a, a lovely year, 2019, in. And uh, the first couple of months of the year uh, were, was working with the business, with, with the leadership team, who had, frankly, almost thrown their hands up in terms of, uh, you know, abandoning digital transformation uh because it was too complex and so we came to them with, with an approach saying why don't we just start over what we could start off with a completely new platform in the cloud and get you to a variable cost uh a model and so in the first couple of months uh was basically building the vision for that uh greenfield platform um uh, building out a high level architecture view and then and a roadmap for building it out as well as the investment case so uh, limiting the risk and managing uh, this venture very tightly, we managed it almost as almost as a startup, you know, with a kind of venture capital approach. The the the, the new entity needed to prove its worth every three months and, and get new funding based on making progress. So we set that up in the first two months with the business case, and then uh, in, in literally eight months, starting in February with a soft launch in uh, September. We, uh, we built this platform, uh, and again, with MVPs, minimum viable products, and I'll explain that uh, in a minute. Um, so the, the challenge was to, was to set this up independently uh, because they really wanted also to attract new talent and new blood into the company. Um, they carved it off as a new co, uh, and there was a lot of discussion as to whether they needed to set up a new legal entity, and, and ultimately they chose to do so. Uh, they didn't have to, but they, they chose to do so. And uh, they worked with uh, us, a number of uh, 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 short-term contractors, and then uh, they, they, we brought on uh, you know, digital natives, if you will, 
of folks who actually some from outside the industry who are really good at customer experience and uh, cobbling together um, microservices in the cloud. And MVP, I think, was very key to enabling us to uh, you know, launch this, this company in nine months, eight to nine months. With an MVP, it's a minimum viable product, okay? It's not all the bells and whistles. It was, in this case, we started off with a simple term life product, uh, an uh, accident and health indemnity product, and a theft protection product for renters, okay? Uh, so we were in all different lines of business. Um, and basically the idea is get in the market, start interacting with customers, modify your experience over time, improve functionality over time, and then over, you know, oh, and as as we iterate through this, now they started out with three products. Nine months later, after launch, they're up to I think seven or eight products. They dropped one, which they knew, and not all your products are going to uh, succeed from day one. But the goal being, this new digital company uh, is on track to uh, generate over, actually over 20% of their new 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 business uh, within five years. Um, I'll quickly breeze through the uh, the architecture, but I think the key point is that uh, the policy platform was probably the biggest uh, you know biggest expense. But again, we uh, we we did a licensing deal with the company, so the fixed costs or the capital costs were were converted into op opex costs, right? So we're we're paying by the month and by the transaction for the policy platform, and then added onto it, uh, you know, a, a claims module. Uh, a, a data lake and a customer relationship management, business process management packages, as well as an analytics package. I started out actually with Google Analytics, which is you know maybe not industrial strength, but again, the idea was let's get in the market and then we'll upgrade our analytics later, right? Let's just get in there with something. Uh, but as you see on the very top, the customer interaction layers, you know, are everything from laptop to uh, you know mobile apps to a chat bots. And, uh, and also connecting out to um, third parties who will ultimately become our marketing partners. And if you haven't looked at uh, the InsureTech world lately, I think uh, you'd be well served because uh, the, the uh, offerings are uh, maturing rapidly and they are now industrial strength. I could not have said that two to three years ago. Uh, there are platforms for customer engagement. There are platforms for ingesting data to help you underwrite better. Uh, you know, actually robotics and AI is now practical, I would say. Uh, we were able to automate many of the underwriting processes uh, and, and some of the customer, uh, customer service requests. So uh, I would say that in that case, in that case, uh, you know, we, we were well served by, with, a, with a, a number of different vendors. And just to say on this, on this page, these are not the vendors we selected. It's just an illustration of the types of vendors that are available across, you know, product underwriting customer service and claims so we are uh we, we've wanted to wrap up uh and leave a little bit of room for uh time for questioning um so we put together i guess what we would say is sort of a ceo checklist or the c-suite checklist for managing your covid response and it sort of goes in three three waves you know the first one we touched on which was you know, let's 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 keep the lights on. Let's take care of our people. Let's keep them productive, and let's let's build a, a senior management consensus around you know how we're doing today, but also what does this look like you know post whenever whenever this whenever stability returns, and what will that new normal look like? How do we how do we modify the way we you know assess risks? Uh, how do we how do we plan for multiple scenarios? As because we don't none of us can predict how this will play out, so we should have a couple of scenarios in our back pocket. Um, and again, uh, I think we're all convinced that as consumers, you know, deal more and more uh, with contactless and touchless experiences in other industries. Uh, you know, we 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 would we would we would have said this in January, but I think we say this even more strongly now. Um, you know, behavior, consumer behavior is is probably changed forever. Don, did you have any? Uh, you also had, I think, some uh, observations here. Yeah, I think the the keys here, as a remote workforce comes into play, and as the digital uh, changes user expectations, both employees, vendors, 
customers that strong central uh, control room is critical and accelerating the key uh, uh, events that need to happen will really help limit the frustration, the rework, and uh, expense that comes along with it. So in this trying time, staying flexible by uh, providing very focused direction uh, consistently across the organization, and then following up with actions that are consistent is critical. With that, with that, uh, we're, we're, these are our, our prepared uh, comments. We'd love to uh, take any other questions that come up. Um, uh, Don and Robert, uh, there were no additional questions that uh, that came up. So uh, let me move to uh, wrap this up by thanking both of you for this presentation. Um, I don't know if you wanted to cover the uh, this page. <laughs> well, it's sort of self-explanatory, but but uh, I, I think we talked about resilience uh and you know being able to adapt uh you know we're all smart okay uh but i think that the skill that we need to hone here is, is our ability to adapt and be able to think through uh, what would happen if you know scenario a b or c or even some other undreamed of scenario emerges well thanks to, to both of you and again uh, to all the listeners i apologize for the earlier uh, sound quality uh, we'll work on that. For the next webinar, which is scheduled for Thursday, August 27th, a uh, couple months before the election, and uh, we'll have a political analyst, a pollster, Scott Rasmussen, who will uh, talk about the election, and it uh, hopefully will be uh, that much more timely uh, at the end of August. So once again, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your participation. So long.